And good evening, everybody. Welcome to Toot Sweet Social Club and our first Meet Your Maker of 2014. I'm Sean Quinn with Julian Fayard. We've got Azor Wines. We've got Purlieu. We've got Cultivar. We've got Edict. I mean, we've got a lot of wine to drink tonight. I hope uh, people watching and participating can see. Um, I'm glad we've got a nice studio audience tonight because... There's a lot of wine to go through, a lot, and we're just really happy to be able to hang out, talk about these wines, talk about how you came to Napa Valley a little bit. You know, this is your second time where you and I got to hang out, but this is your first show, so and you get to be here by yourself, and it's all about you, So, and all of this wine that you've created, so I'm really excited to see what you have uh, brought to share with us, so let's get into it. Let's get into it. Let's get started. Um, so wh- when I thought about, you know, doing the show is, you know, to introduce to the, the people that don't know uh, mm-hmm. my wines. But I wanted to show also a little bit the beginnings and uh, and then what we are today. So that I think that shot of all those wines is, you know, all the people that trust me to to make their wines. And there is a, a you know, very diverse uh, project in there, uh, mostly estates uh, driven, single vineyard driven wines. Napa Valley, 100%. Um, and then we have Azure, which is my personal label that I started with my wife. And uh, tonight we're going to taste a 2010, if uh, Didier can open it, uh, of Sauvignon Blanc. I wanted to show a little bit how you know, I make Sauvignon Blanc in a little bit of different style. Mm-hmm. And the idea is that uh, they are not meant to be drunk six months after, but they age very well. Okay. So we're going to drink a 2010, and then uh, we'll... we'll Appreciate. Uh, I also brought a Nicholson Jones. That was the very first project I did in Napa, uh, 2008 uh, Syrah. Okay. This is a single vineyard from Sugarloaf. Uh, it's been aged 40 months in barrel. <laughs> did you uh, forget about it? No. <laughs> <laughs> the you know Cal Cal Nicholson is uh, was waiting a long time to get it. Very patient man. It, exactly. Okay. Very good. Uh, I like it. I'm looking forward to this one. And then w- once we get through it, we'll uh, we'll have a, a little surprise. I was gonna uh, say I see two wines over here that have handwritten labels, and anytime a winemaker is willing to uh, bring some handwritten labels, you know that it's gonna be some uh, some fun stuff. So is it uh, is it already in bottle or is this right out of the uh, the barrique? This is from the barrel, uh, and it's it's uh, it's coming it's coming. Uh, I don't know when, <laughs> so uh, I'm I'm sure before uh, 15 mm-hmm. we're gonna bottle that, but it'll take a little time. Oh, did you think? Yes, some floaters. Oh, what have we got here? So we we have a. Uh, with Azure, we have a little... Uh... We need more glasses. Can we get two more glasses from the... Uh, oh, here, here, just big one? Oh, well, there goes the other one. I was going to compare because that was the uh, oh, yeah. 11 that I had in that class, but that's all right. Thank you, Mark. Cool. So let's get that one going. Let's get that one going. So what? while well, we're getting this set up, but uh, what do I have here in this monster? Uh, so you have the 2010 uh, Azure Sauvignon Blanc, which is a single vineyard from Rutherford. Uh, here we have the Shushus. We have the real winemaker in the room. Hey guys. Yep. Here. Check this guy in here. Anytime you need to use two hands to pour wine, it's a good sign. <laughs> so the dog do- passes off. Can you share that around? Shoo. Oh, hello. So here's the real winemaker. Oh, good. Finally, I get to talk to somebody important. It's uh. Um, it's uh, well, the assistant Teddy is not here tonight, but we'll uh, we'll we'll do without. I think last time we did uh, the show, the show, Elon was pregnant with him, so and, oh, okay. and it's nine days are overdue. Nine days overdue. So, and so now you get to uh, be a part of the show. Welcome. How are you? You shake his hand, Shushu. You high five. No. Oh wow. <laughs> Maybe we can ask a question. How how do we make wine? Can we make wine with the grapes. I think it's timid. Too he's many timid. People. Well, he's got a fantastic uh, Volkswagen truck going on there. So. He's going to be, he's been uh, following me in the vineyards and the winery. It's interesting how a two year old knows uh, wine. <laughs> so let's taste. Yeah, let's taste. We've got, I've got the 2010 out of the three liter here and the 2011 mm. in the uh, 750 the here. What do we got? So it's it, the interesting uh, part of, about Sauvignon Blanc, and we have more wines after we can open for the audience if they have question and they want to taste uh, or hear us taste it. Uh, we can compare different 
vineyards and different appellations. But um, the, the idea with Sauvignon Blanc for me is, is a wine that is it has a life, lifespan of like three to eight years old. Okay. And uh, you can go beyond that, but I think uh, um, when, when you have a maturity, a certain piece in the wine, then you have a more beautiful wine. And that's why we do those three liters so you can age them. Mm -hmm. You can also party with them a little <laughs> more easily. It's maybe the reason number one. I was going to say, I think there's a winery in Napa Valley who only makes one of their white wines in 375s and Magnums. Because they say you're either going to have a glass of this wine or you're going to party with this wine. There's no in between, and I think we can say the same about the Ezra. That's that's a good point. So, um, cheers, by the cheers. Way. Yes, thank you. So the the idea and everyone around us. I don't know if you can do a, a quick shot, but it's uh, basically I work with most of those people. Uh, they are every one of them is a little component of the the chain, and uh, you know some do the cork, some do the foils. Is he playing with it? There we go. Okay, good smell. Can you hear us now? <laughs> Can you drink some wine? Can you smell it? Oh, here we go. Ooh. Oh. Only the French can do that. <laughs> <laughs> Is it good? Is it tasty? Good smell, me. She'll give you more with this alcohol. The sweetness. Um. So. Yeah, let's get back to work. Let's get back to work because this is such difficult work that we do, and somebody has to. Complicated life. Oh my gosh! Wow, that's the 2010. And we, we can pass the 2011, 2011. around too. If you guys want to compare? Make sure everybody gets a little bit. Yeah. Wow, talk about two very very unique wines. Um, you can see, you know, how they interact, how they are from the same vein, but between age. The style in which they've been made, you can really start to see how the wine changes, you know, especially in a Sauvignon Blanc after the one year. And it's really starting to take on very kind of old world style. I mean, for, for Napa for a Napa Valley wine, you put this right in front of me right now, and I, I think I'm thinking opposite side of the ocean, and I'm really really happy about that. So what well, can you tell me about the style and what you're working with when you craft this wine that brings that in? Because I know you have a very big background in producing you know you started in france you spent time in the loire before coming to napa so how does that influence this wine um i, I think it's the appreciation for the wines you know you you uh, you, you make the wines you like to drink mm -hmm. um and at least i hope because it's more fun well that and if you can't sell your wine you have to be the one to drink the wine of course so <laughs> it's a good point <laughs> um uh, 10 11 we have two cold vintage okay. uh, cold in different uh, aspects uh, 2010 was uh, cold and rainy at the end okay and 2011 uh, was cold throughout uh, i think a little less cold on average than <coughs> 10 but we had severe ripening problems so vignon blanc is a little bit different for that um it, it you know we don't need that heat in october to finish as we do for cabernet sauvignon right we're a little more safe um so what you can taste between the two wines, 10 has a little more structure, no bolder shoulders, and 11 has a little more uh, citric acidity, you know, a little more uh, uh, bite into the acids, and I think that's that's the vintage difference. It's the same vineyard, same winemaking techniques, uh, same people, mm -hmm. so it uh, smells the same. Um, what I want to show is how, you know, aromatically, uh, the, the persistence and the intensity of the notes stays very, very even. And yeah. even though you have a, a mouthfeel that is rounder, you have a, a, the acidity that rounds a little bit, aromatically it keeps pushing, it keeps developing. And I think that's what's important in Sauvignon Blanc. If you want to be able to uh, to age a Sauvignon Blanc and make wine that, that I, I believe in wine that can age, we, can, uh, we, can, we, we have to focus on the aromatics of wine and we have to focus on the aromatics that can, that can develop in, into, the, into the bottle. So sometimes, you know, you expect to see them when you drink that wine young, you know, you, you have that barrel sample or you have uh, that, you know, one or two year old just released wine. But what of those aromatics will disappear and mm -hmm. which one will appear? Okay. And that's, I think, uh, a part of the finesse of Napa Valley that we need to work on. And um, something that you and I have talked about and something that I think you've hit on a little bit with these wines is finesse. Mm -hmm. And in, in crafting wines that have not only a balance and a finesse to them, but have the ability to age, you know, even something as so simple as Sauvignon Blanc, all the way through Cabernet Sauvignon, 
I like the way you've hit on needing different components that show up in the beginning, but also having things that develop over time. And with this big style that Napa is all of a sudden becoming very popular for, do you think they may be forgetting about all those other things and just hitting that part one? And then all of a sudden, if somebody does try and age the wine, it's gone. Is that is that happening in some cases, do you think? I, I think, uh, you know, it's uh, a simple fact is you, you have to sell the wine. So you have to be able to, you can't sell the wine saying, hey, don't worry, it'll be better in 10 years. Right. So you have to have a wine that is pleasing, that is, you know, and a lot of the wines are drunk young. So it's important to make wines that are approachable and that are easy to drink. Um, it's also important because we, we are in Napa Valley. We make wines that are very expensive, that are usually going to collector cellars, to very high-end restaurants, to people that manage their cellars, that collect their wines. And so there is a need to have wines that will withstand the time mm -hmm. and will be showing you know, their quality and finesse in the future. And uh, I think that for me, that's a big part that should not be forgotten into making wine. Um, in, in the shot, we, we saw some labels. We, we have some wines, you know, that are in the 20 to 40 price point, and those wines are meant to be drunk right away. Right. They're not meant to put aside for 15 years. But when we start to talk about single vineyard estates, uh, we're starting to refine the wines. And, you know, we always ta talk about ageability, and I, I want to be able to prove it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a little bit the, what I'm bringing today is wines that are, you know, four to... So the oldest is uh, five, seven years old. And just to show how the change is happening slowly. But uh, uh, for me, it's the proof that what I'm doing, I think, is right. Well, the proof is in the pudding, as they say. And, you know, when you can taste the wine and you can taste it year mm -hmm. after year after year, and you can see that not only do the younger wines show well, but also as you move down the line, you've got more and more that are holding up in time and are really continuing on not only stylistically similar, but of the same quality, you've, you've done what you've set out to do. Exactly. And, and, and it's, uh, so there is different, I, there was, I mean, we're not supposed to, or we didn't plan on drinking it, but no. there is a contract, and a contrast with the rosé, for example. This is a wine that is meant to be drunk young. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I grew up in Provence, we drink it a certain type of rosé, and we, we make it, you know, from Syrah, Grenache, Morvel. And we make it to be drunk at any time of the day for any reason. And it's actually uh, in France, you know, uh, um, in terms of quantity consumed, number one is red, number two is rosé. Mm. So it's a really large part of the market. And I hope the, the, the American market takes on and, and really uh, enjoy rosé as much as the French do. Uh, I think it's a beautiful product. It's still way um, underdeveloped. It's, it's, I would have to agree with you. I think Rosé is super underdeveloped in the United States. We have had um, this reputation mm -hmm. for a long time where a lot of people, when they think Rosé or they think pink, they're going to immediately think sweet wines. Yes. But that, I think, in the last few years where people are becoming more educated, when they're really getting into wines and they're seeing more than just the same names producing pink wines, but they're seeing lots more pink wines, they go, well... Something must be going on here, so maybe I should try one of those. And then it's becoming more interesting. And it's actually, Rosé has a bit of a, a niche market. You know, and there are a few American producers. I know that there are um, producers in France that only make Rosé in some cases. And I know that there are now a few American producers out there that only make Rosé. And they just love it. And they're getting it out there and they're spreading the word. And, I mean, I wore my pink tie because we were drinking it. Well, for so. the support. <laughs> But, um, it, it, I think it's very true. It's very true, and we have a, a, an uh, you know a, a mass of consumers that is really being uh, discerning in their taste and 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 interrogating themselves on why should I drink that wine and what's what's make me like it. And then it's it's a very very difficult world, you know, that you get scared of because it's so complex. I think just trying, getting out there, finding the couple niche of wine that you like, and try one that you think you don't like every once in a while. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, it's a free world. Oh. Um, so, do you want to move on to the? I mean, we've got so much wine here today. I feel like this is just. I wanted to talk about real quick, and yeah. and we didn't get to the flavor profile yes. on on the Sauvignon Blanc, and 
you know, I know this isn't so much a tasting show. This is just a chance for you and I to hang out. But the flavor profile for me is so different between these two wines because this is really that bright, fruit-forward, tropical. But this is starting to have this beautiful, almost savory characteristic, which, you know, if I'm out by the pool, I want this. But if I'm eating food, I want this. Yeah. And I think the, the answer is in the, in the aging of white wine especially, uh, there's a roundness of that acidity, mm -hmm. and you get a little more of the butter sensation, you know, sweet touch into the mouthfeel. And so those broader shoulder makes it that you can you can eat it with food very easily. Uh, Ten, a little more ripe, a little more sun, a little more uh, structure to it. Mm. But it, it, it's it's aromatically. If you want to just talk about the aromatic profile, I think you you know you still uh, get those styles, this fresh grass. Lemon curd, you know, coming through. Oh my gosh, yes. And this is all the tiles that are developing over time. And they are still here producing aromatics. And we opened uh, 2008 uh, for Christmas, and it was still fresh and vibrant. We were like, maybe it's time to drink that bottle and it'll be gone. And that was the first vintage of uh, Azure. So. Real quick, so we can move on to the other wines, um, because we have so many that we can even touch on if we want to get into these today. But um, without getting too much in depth into the science of it, but as a winemaker in the process of producing these wines, what are maybe two or three of the steps that you think you have to take in order to achieve that aromatic stability? You know, picking early versus picking late, fermenting cold versus fermenting hot in all those stages and how that those things maybe help you develop this style. Yeah, I think there is a, first there is a soil. Um, being on rockier, rockier soil, um, Rutherford is great for that. Um, brings us some acidity backbones to the wine that I think will, will age, you know, it'll be part of the body of the wine. Um, in, the, in, the, in the vineyard, you always want to avoid to overexpose your fruits, okay. and temperature will, will dissolve those acids. So that's, we're going to work a lot on the acidity and the, the acid profile of the wine, and then we're going to protect uh, against any excess. And this is, you know, really canopy management. I mean, California, the game is the sun. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I think you, you know, by being product, you almost have to, to make it so maybe it'll never get to ripeness. So you have to product, so product it too much. So you're telling us that we need to edge on the side of maybe you don't get quite ripe enough, but if you do, it's going to be perfect. I think if it takes longer, it'll be better. Okay. And, and then after in the fermentation, uh, you know, we have cold, mod mo moderately cold fermentation. Actually, they are not that cold. And that, that allows for some reaction chemical processes that, that helps those molecules to become what we call precursors. And precursors are uh, little, you know, semi-produced molecules mm -hmm. that are stable in the wine, but that you can't smell. And they will develop with chemical reaction as it's aging. And okay. that's what we're looking for is, is to have that potential of, uh, of molecules that will develop over time. So in a sense that if you started fermenting this wine maybe a little bit too hot, you, they either aren't developing those precursors or maybe some of those precursors yeah. are... So too high in temperature, you'll burn them off. Too cold in temperature, you'll develop a different kind. Okay. And that's a kind that is usually very fragrant, very uh, given early on. Right. So you have super aromatics, but six months later, the wine is flat. Okay. So the game is long term. And, that's, and it's a choice. It's a personal choice. And, and all, all of these are, I mean, this Sauvignon Blanc really is about the long term, and it's, and it's delicious. It's wonderful. And real quick, uh, since we have such a wonderful audience here this evening, and while we've got these uh, wines in front of us, I'm trying to see who has light glasses, any quick questions for Julian about these wines and about the Sauvignon Blanc or the Rosé, something you've always wanted to ask him? Well, and you got to come over here. People can't hear you from over there. Okay. So I wanted to ask you about uh, the 2010. Is this a 100% Sauvignon Blanc? Yes. Okay. So, so uh, what is it that what is it about 2010 that makes this so fruit forward? Um, I, I think that the way you, you taste the fruit today is because of the fermentation process and the, you know what we did with the fruit in the vineyard and then as you were saying you about know, the fermentation. So the the only part I didn't touch or I touched really quickly is the decision in the in the fermentation. So 100% stainless steel, mm -hmm. 
control temperature, control yeast as well, and then uh, very steady fermentation. So, are the 2010 and the 2011 all the same cones? Uh, yes, it's the same venue, same uh, yeah, same block. Right. So they didn't change the, the vines in between. I hope. So no, so you're work, you're working with consistent vineyards. You're working with consistent methods. Um, you're picking at consistent numbers, whether it's sugar and acids. Um, but really, is the variation is simply vintage to vintage, and any developmental process in that. Exactly, and 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 I touch up, you know, a little bit of some certain section of the block uh, to adjust and to try to venture mm -hmm. in a different direction because I think uh, you're always in research of so balance. Now, in 2010, did you drop fruit? 20, 2010, uh, we drop every year fruit. Uh, that's on except 11. 11 actually was very, very too, short. Too cold. Well, the set in the Sauvignon Blanc was really bad. Uh, it's one of the worst. But 10 uh, was was fairly croppy, and 12, and then 13 was in our. More <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Okay, thank you. Bye. Anybody else? Real quick question before we switch out once. I always want to get as many questions in, get everybody. You know, and you don't have to come up on, on camera if you don't want to. Just shout out the question. I'll make sure to repeat it. Anybody? Okay. Drink more. Drink more. <laughs> yes, we've got a lot of wine to go through. Uh, so we, we skipped through quickly the rosé. I mean, it's starting it's, to be a... I'm leaving that right there. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> so uh, the other wine I wanted to show tonight is a 2008. Uh, it's a Nicholson John Syrah. It's made from a small vineyards uh, located south of Napa. Very, very cold area. It's almost Carneros, but on the west side. Okay. And it's that bench that you drive by the highway. I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people drive by and never see the vineyard. So it's good, but we I think we should showcase the wine because it's really worth it. Uh, 2008, we did the regular bottling, and mm -hmm. then I held three barrels on the side. Uh, I felt the wine was so special that it was worth spending, you know, researching what long aging will do to it. And so it sits 40 months in the barrel. Uh, and we finally bottled it. And uh, now it's, you know, 2008, we're in 2014. That, that's patience right there. And uh, we're starting to slow it. So it's a very, very small production, um, beautiful wine. Um, the clone, some people are, because it's a single vineyard, so single clone, it's clone 877, uh, which I like for the depth and the intensity, uh, the aromatic intensity. So you, you find sometimes Syrah, like the Alban clone, that is very, very dark and very intense. And mm -hmm. you find those, those Syrahs that are very fruity, they are very uh, elegant, but they miss that core. And I think that clone has the two. Huh? I just want to share with you guys. Gonna... She shared around. Thank you. Yeah. This is, oh my gosh, this is, this is beautiful color. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful one. And this is super aromatic. This is you know, for, for being a 2008 and for, you know, 40 months in oak, you know, you almost look at maybe drinking an older wine, but this is bright and fresh and, and fruit. It's just beginning. It's and just beginning. This is an amazing, amazing wine right here. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's been open for um, maybe 45 minutes now, and, mm -hmm. and it's just picking up our material. It is. It is very different when you first opened it. It was kind of a punch in the face, mm -hmm. which is okay. Every once in a while, you need somebody to kind of Flicking in the nose and wake you up, but yes. this is this is really now becoming very approachable, very fun and and, and friendly. And when you when you're working with a wine like this, and you have your normal, like you kind of touched on, you bottled a certain amount of it, and if you really really like that bottling, you it takes a lot to basically say no 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 no, I'm I'm going to hold on to those and I'm just going to let them go and let them go and let them go. What is something that finally tells you now it's okay to bottle? I mean, could you have let this go another, I mean, 10 months, 20 months? I mean, we say this like it's, you know, a kind of a, a fun thing and we're, and we're being flippant about it. But in essence, you've got your product, you know, locked up. It's not in bottle, so you're not selling it. You're not getting it out there in front of people. So, you know, if you're making somebody else's wine and you're telling them, nope, you're not allowed to sell it. Nope, you're not allowed to sell it. You know, people might get a little bit interested to what's going on. So, so it, it's the it's the good part of working with uh, people that are patient, mm -hmm. uh, open minded, um, and I think after you said it, the proof is in pudding. 
you, you have you have to be patient with wine. It's the, the first thing is time. You can't push time. Uh, you can you know there's techniques to kind of go around time, but it's never going to be um, waiting. Mm -hmm. Um, I think for this one, you know, is, is a good example was how many barrels do I hold up? Should I hold up? And, uh, and then you do it and now we don't have enough wine. And it's usually what happens. And that's the way I like to keep it is always on the, on the restraint side is, you know, let, let's try it. Let's give it a go, but make it, uh, safe. Um, and, and then see where we go. Uh, we could have gone too far and then, then you have the wine that you don't want to borrow. And that's the other uh, risk. That's the risk you take, and of course. But I think in anything, you have you have to take some risk uh, to to do something special to bring. If you're just safe, you know, you you bottle 14, 18 months, and you put in the bottle, and that's it. And that's just playing it safe. Yeah. And that's just you know making your wines, doing what the normal steps are: one, two, three, four, getting into the bottle, getting in front of people, and selling it. Exactly. Whereas in this case, and and I think in the industry that there's a lot of experimentation going on, a lot of people who are willing to take those risks, but I also think that there are a lot of people who have kind of begun to rest on their laurels in a sense, especially in, in Napa Valley, which has such great diversity that there are a few wineries out there that maybe just have gotten so used to their formula that they're never going to change it, mm -hmm. where there are a lot of winemakers out there playing with unique varietals, playing with un unique styles, and what are you seeing maybe trends that are happening and what you're working within in that sense? Um, you know, with wine, you, I mean, when you do single vineyards and single, uh, single, you know, little blocks, you find an identity, you want to stick there because you find that right balance, you find that right expression. And it's great when, when you have tasting and you go through, a, you know, five, six, seven wines and people are like, oh my God, all those wines, we, we haven't tasted them anywhere else. That's what you want. You want mm -hmm. the personality behind the label. So finding a recipe and finding kind of the sweet spot for for your brand or your vineyard is a good thing. And marketing wise, it allows your consumer to to uh, to identify your product and to uh, to taste it. The, the other part is we need always to push the, the ball a little further, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and and that I don't I don't mind doing it. And, well, that's what you were saying when you were working with the Sauvignon Blanc, and even with this wine. It's you have your main component of the wine that you're going to be working with, but you always have that little bit that you might risk a little bit more on. And if it doesn't work, okay, it didn't work, but at least you, had, you gave it a go, as you said. And, uh, and to discover, you know, someone has to take the risk. Is the explorer that goes by himself and he follows his ID. And, you know, a few fail on the way and some go through, and, and you want to be one of those that go through. So it's, it's just rigging. Having, having the right people around you, having the right vineyards, uh, being you know patient and paying attention to what you do, and usually it works. It's only wine. <laughs> and you know what? If, if you, God forbid, if you can't drink it, you can at least make um, vinegar out of it. It'll get used in some way. Or brandy. Or brandy. <laughs> we'll, we'll work on that one. Might have to have a brandy tasting here one night. I you think can do that. You can definitely do that. Now this wine itself, so it's. When you when you produce this, when you're working in the vineyard with, with Syrah, you know, when everybody talks about Napa Valley, talk about Cabernet, talk about Bordeaux varietals, this of course is Syrah. Yes. So why Syrah, why Napa? Real quick, um, before you know yeah. we start getting into more questions. And it was a fortuit encounter. I think Napa uh, I mean Napa Syrah is beautiful. I don't think Cabernet should grow everywhere. Mm -hmm. That's one point. But it's Napa. Cabernet grows in Napa whether it's Coombsville with its Grenaris, it's going to go Cabernet, right? It should, but some people don't follow the rules. <laughs> I think we said it already. Um, it's, it's, uh, I think Syrah is, is, is seductive. It's beautiful. This is an expression of Syrah that I think is not, like if you take a purist, Cotroti, mm -hmm. uh, it'll be horrified by it because it's, it's California in, in a sense. It's big, it's rich, it's bold, it's creamy, uh, but it has tons of little red fruits on top of it. Oh. And and there's that black core. If if you're Cote Roti, which is a different side, it's a lot colder. We have you know the violet. We have a very very refined flavors to it, and and a body that is not as full and lush, but is in length and and, and texture. So this is definitely American California Napa Syrah. Uh, the fact that we can put it through 40 months of barrel 
that you know it's today in our glass is because the wine can handle it. Mm -hmm. We can hold that, and and that's because the structure is so massive. So, you know, we, we talk about Cabernet, and we have that research for finesse and structure. Uh, we can find it with Syrah as well. Uh, you know, Sauvignon Blanc is a bit the same. Is they are both aromatic varietals, yep. so they are easily displaying a, a varietal character. Okay. Uh, so they tolerate a little more uh, side changes. You know, they'll still express the clone will be driving the style. But then after, you know, um, how we farm it and, and where we ferment it, we'll really make it a unique product. And that's what we try to have today with that Syrah. It's something you can't find anywhere else. So in, in the sense of, in, in setting this wine up to spend 40 months in barrel, you know, we, we, t we touched real quickly on, on some of the viticulture and, and, and winemaking practices that you do in the Sauvignon Blanc. What are some of those things you do with the Syrah, you know, in, in canopy management and maybe, you know, letting it hang a little bit longer, maybe really restricting the number of, you know, clusters per vine, that sort of thing? Yeah, the yields are about two ton an acre, very, very, very tiny. Very uh, tiny. It's almost you look for the berries in the vineyard. It desolates the farmer, and and we cope with him. But uh, the wine's so good that. Uh, so how, do, how does the how does the vineyard owner walk through his vineyard and he sees lots of green and only a very few bits of grapes and wonders what all his vines are doing at that point? Well, it's it's part of those people that that grow vines to to make wine, mm -hmm. and they don't just grow grapes to sell them. And so we have that very tight point. relations where we can go further and we can understand the farming at that level. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, it, Syrah is, is very sensitive to it, yet very resistant. Um, you want to have those dimple berries, you want to go a little bit in that extreme world where aromatically can take a hit, but it'll still express itself okay. through it. So it, it's, it's really a, a universal varietal that you can plant in very dry, you know, rocky soil, and then, or you can be the feet in the clay. In a, in, a, in a wet climate, and they'll still make wines that are uh, of quality. So for me, the site is special because of it's a full west facing, very rocky, um, volcanic. It's basically fragmented rock, and there is no dirt in between. <laughs> so, so it's kind of a square chateau of you pap, if you want, uh, if you can call it like that. I was going to say, if, if you're comparing this wine to somewhere in the Rhone, you brought up Cote Roti. Where would you maybe put it in? Yeah, I'll put it in uh, Lirac uh, Vaqueras. Oh, wow. Uh, with even more structure. Mm -hmm. uh, I think California is magic for the amount of sunshine we get. And we never have to fight with the rain, except a couple of years in and out. Or this year. Yeah. When did it rain last? Does anybody know when it rained last? Did it rain? 2011. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's. Yeah, last it, year, it, that's right. still waiting. I throw water in the morning. So, oh, it's not. No. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's so we we have those aromatic varietals that do a great job. It's interesting wine. So for the sake of diversity, I'm <coughs> glad I can work with them. This is this is really good Syrah. What do any thoughts on the Syrah from uh, from our audience? What do you, in a lot of the Syrahs that you may have had in the past, comparing this one to them or this on its own? I mean, what do you think about a wine spending you know 40 months in barrel and yeah. Yum. I like that. Yum. One word answer. Sorry. Anybody else? No, come on. You guys, somebody's got to have a question. Oh, Rick. I'm kind of wondering the, in relation to the rest of the marketplace, where we're being told that California's growing way too much Syrah, it takes a certain level of courage, clarity, and certainty about what it is that you're doing. It's going to make this Syrah that you're going to release five, six years down the road, stand out from this terrible overproduction of Syrah, or the terrible overproduction of Merlot or Zinfandel that we hear so much about. The, the, right. the big talk this week is Silicon Valley Bank's outlook. Right, this is really, it's a really... Oh, don't grow Syrah. There's way too much of it. And at the same time, you know what you're doing. Right. And so... Um, how do we talk about it today, and how do we think we're going to be talking about it next year and five, six, seven years down the road where there are so many Syrah makers who have left the marketplace? That's a, that's a really good question, and there's a lot of different... Can you recap 
Yeah, I'm going to recap it because there's a lot of different pieces to that question. Yeah. And I just want to make sure that Julian and I have got it. Um, one point you made was that Syrah is believed by some to maybe be overplanted in California, that, mm, there's, a, it is. that there's a lot more um, growing than we can drink, um, that utilizing a style like this within that scope is going to be different because it has so many years of lag that you are very um, dependent on how the market shifts. So if this wine is spending, you know, close to four years in production from fermentation through 40 months in barrel, what's the um, economy going to be like by the time it finally comes out? And then just how does it set itself apart from all those other overplanted Syrahs other than the fact that, yeah, we left it in barrel for 40 months? Um, it, well, there's that. And then what did you see happening as you bottle aged it in making your release decision? On the, how are you watching that? And how, yeah. and how does, once you get it into the bottle, finally change the way that this wine shows up? I just want to make sure everybody can hear the question. That's why I'm repeating so, it. I think the, the first answer, I agree with you, there, there's a mass of Syrah out there. Uh, it's, it's um, I mean, you, you see it. But there's not enough wine produced in America for all the American drinkers. We're still safe on that. It'll, it'll get drunk by. Right, somebody. it'll be consumed by somebody. It'll go into something. It's not gonna. It's not gonna hang out in your backyard. That's for but, sure. But but um, actually, gets you know you have the 25 percent rule, uh, so it allows you to blend some varietal. So basically, you're drinking a lot of Syrah you don't know. Right. In a lot of wines. Um, so that's I think where it gets folded in. It's it's really an uh, an helper. For this particular product here, this wine, this bottle, what we do is, you know, the only people that access this are, are um, consumers that know us, mm -hmm. that are already uh, buying our wines. Uh, they buy a couple different, you know, five, six a case, and then they, you know, they do what the collector does, is open a bottle every once in a while and look at it and look at it measure. And that's the part where, you know, we go into the unknown, and I can't, teleport myself in the future and say, oh, this will be very good in 2010. I have a sense for it. I see other wines aging, but it's always uh, a guess. Um, the good thing when it's in barrels is you can you can call it. Mm -hmm. You say, okay, now I think we're going a little too far. You know, you you're, you age with your wines. So um, you see your wine changing and you know the personality. So you know where it's heading. Um, and And so you have that flexibility of releasing it. And then you know, in general, that ball aging is a lot slower than barrel aging. And that fact helps you to, if you have that sensation of how the wine is going to age, you know, you say, okay, now I think we're at a good spot where we can let the ball take the relay and finish it in our cellars. And so that's after why there are so many different wines, because it's, uh, it's a feeling. It's not... Is your high-level Syrah finding its way into GSM? Rich. Okay. <laughs> no, don't worry. We do actually, we only have a few minutes left, and we've got these last two wines, Rich. So, uh, okay, we got only two seconds for this question. Exactly. I'm sorry to cut you off, okay. because it's, we do have these other wines that we want to get on Is there a place for the very high-end Syrah in the yes. Grenache Syrah yep. Morbedre? Uh, I think some vineyards do it, uh, especially in Paso. Uh, one that comes to mind is Epoch Vineyards, for example. Magic uh, blends. I like my single. I like my single vineyards, uh, very pure. And that's something, you know, being French, we have different rules, a little stricter. And so the idea is to, to kind of bring that a little bit in my wines. So when I tell it's a Cabernet Sauvignon, it's Cabernet. It's not But 85. But you're Provence. Provence, yeah, and uh, but I French. It's yes. part of France. Right. <laughs> yeah, and this man has made wine all the way up the West Coast, so he's worked with a pretty few big um, wineries. And I mean, anybody want if you want to just find out, uh, either, any one of your websites goes into um, detail about your history in, in France and growing up in Provence. You know, making wine in, in some of the first growth. Uh, first growth Bordeaux Chateau, and and you know spending yeah. some time in Loire. I mean, yeah, yeah. When I, it comes to this French wines, there's no question. I, I packed my bag for six years and traveled the world and different areas. 
And so it's it's magic to see the differences. I think everyone should do it, especially if you want to become a winemaker or if you work in the wine industry, you should travel. Uh, go taste. Go taste. Go taste. You know, it, it's one of those things you can taste wines from all over the world, but until you've tasting that wine in the place that it was produced to you, does it all of a sudden maybe click as to, oh, okay, now I get it. So I'm going to hand you. That, that's what I liked about studying wine is you can carry the bottles in your bag at school. <laughs> <laughs> but that helped, and, and, and that's the only way. So this is a little surprise. Um, this is a new project in Coombsville. You know, Coombsville is one of the newest appellation of uh, Napa Valley. This is the Cabernet Franc uh, for everyone to taste. Yes, and uh, we have a Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, I'm very excited about this. I've been working on it for three years now. Uh, it's, a, it's a little vineyard that we found on the side of the road a little bit. And uh, we really put a lot of love into it. And Coombsville is a magic place. It's very diverse. I mean, I made wine in many, many areas in Napa Valley. And it has its own character. It has its own texture. Because there was no appellation, I think uh, there is not as many wines with Coombsville on the label. And now we have availability uh, for the consumer to compare it to the rest of Napa Valley. And there are wines of their own. So today I brought a Cabernet Franc and a Cabernet Sauvignon, 2012 barrel sample. It's easy to start in 12, you know, in 11 will have been a little more uh, difficult. Uh, the wine name is Covert. Covert. Oh, okay. uh, you, you can Google it, you won't find it. Uh, it's been trademarked, but um, we we should be releasing uh, June, July. June, July. And will you be re in the 2012 will be the first release. 2012 will be the first release. Okay. Yes. And um, so because I mean we did a little bit about aromatic and aging. I think uh, you know often I taste the wines from Tom Farella, and I really enjoy what what he does with it. And he tastes his Merlots that are 10, 15 years old, and they are just beautiful wines. And I think aromatically. Uh, that area is, is, is really a pool of potential for wines uh, in, the, in the aging. And so that's why we're very excited about that and can taste. No, yeah, let's do this. So Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon. So what's production on the It's very tiny production. So yeah. the, the question is, uh, what's the production? We, we're going to have about 50 cases for the Cabernet Franc, 250 yeah. cases for the Cabernet. It's a drop in the bucket, um, but you know it's it's empirical. Um, I believe in Cabernet Franc very much. I think it should be everywhere. But for Coombsville, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet works very well. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful, and it's it's a magic magic wine. There there is a a certain amount of of baking spice and molasses, and in this wine that it's it's beautiful. It's got. True varietal characteristic. It's got the savoriness of Cabernet Franc, but I mean, this is this is this is very <coughs> unique wine. This isn't overly jammy. This isn't. It's, it's structured, but it's not tannin grippy. You know, it's not it's not clawing at you. This is just mouth filling, big, delicious. Opening like a flower. It is, but it's a. It's yeah. not like a little. It's, it's, a, big rose. Rose it's a big rose bowl. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're looking at uh, the monarch roses here instead of the little yes. tiny ones that you get from the grocery store. I mean, this is and, huge. And, and that's, you know, when, when Cabernet Franc shines is when the varietals can express itself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and this moderate weather we have in, uh, in Coombsville allows you to, uh, to um, ripen Cabernet Franc. And Cabernet Franc is very, very sensitive to, uh, I call it the lady of Cabernet. It's, it's it's the personality of the wine is always very fragile, and so if you if you expose it too much, if it ripens too much, then you lose that character. Mm -hmm. And and I think the finesse of Cabernet Franc is in the nose, in the in the texture, in that forefront of aromatics. And right, I think that's that's you. Yeah. Oh, this is beautiful. This is absolutely beautiful. And let's take a real quick moment to talk about this Cabernet Sauvignon. Because with the last five minutes we have, I want to do something fun, but I want to talk about this wine first. I don't want to leave it out. So, Cabernet Sauvignon, bigger structure, bigger texture, which is not always the case. I mean, this Cabernet Franc is solid, but um, you, you get a little more intensity, darkness, black notes, toffee, mocha, cocoa, uh, but then you have that cherry that's mm. coming through. And that's what I'm going to look for is that wine in the next five to eight years is to have that darkness 
mm -hmm. mix with that cherry, and once we'll overlay the other one. Let's say this is a lot more savory spice, lots of fruit, but more kind of crusted fruit, whereas this is just more fruit. Fruit, 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 fruit on top of fruit, on top of fruit, that black black base, but lots of little sprinklings of cherries and things like that. Absolutely wonderful. And then if you start drinking it over an hour, it'll... It'll go, though. <laughs> all these wines, from when you and I first quickly went through them and talked about them before we sat down, versus what we've seen as we've been at this table, it's just been absolutely huge, and it's it's been great, and... I wish we could make the show last two hours so every 15 minutes. I brought we enough kind of wine. So we've got we can... more than enough wine. And actually, something I want to do with the last five minutes is if we could get all the producers that are here who have brought their wine to grab their wine, just so we can see really quick how many different wines that Julianne is working on right now. Because, I mean, you guys have, you know, brought some fantastic wines, and I'll grab some of these other ones just so you oh, can. If, if you want to zoom, yeah. <laughs> I uh, grabbed the Pioli, yeah. I think your son yeah. stole my course. Yeah. Hop right in. We 12. 2012. So, quick yeah. shout out here. Hopping right here. Yeah, yeah we get yeah. everybody else <laughs> in the photo, but I want these guys to really quickly point out. Yeah, we have minutes. Jimmy, so oh. Edict. Uh, Edict, we do a lot of single vineyards uh, coming down the pipe. Cabernet, Coonsville, Centric, with a couple. Uh, surprises uh, up north from Yonville, uh, Oak Knoll, um, and then uh, Jody Harris, which is Caspar and Cultivar Wines. Caspar <laughs> uh, uh, is, is a beautiful estate in Rutherford. Um, it's it's organically grown. They do only oil too, uh, olive oil, and uh, um, the soil is so particular. It's so hard to grow those vines that even organic is a challenge. It is uh, a challenge, yeah. And, but the wines, <laughs> we push them as much as we can. And, and the wines are just beautiful out of there and with, with, with an expression that you don't find in, elsewhere in Rutherford. So I seek them. It's uh, good wines. And then we have Cultivar where we do Appalachian-specific wines as well. And then you've got these guys over here real quick. Yeah, Le Piche, Le Piche uh, top, 100, uh, top 100 from uh, um, the... Um, I'm forgetting the newspaper, uh, the Chronicle, uh, with Purlieu, uh, both centered around uh, Kumsil as well. Le Piche is uh, Napa Valley, um, so a small estate. This is coming online. It's been uh, underground for now, so um, it's been two years of work. Um, edict, we are in the process also. Very cool. Got some great wines, Julian Fayard and all of his wonderful clients and all these great wines. We've got a big dent to make tonight. And so uh, <laughs> get this, some food is, get this, is, this is a reason why everybody who's watching, everybody who's going to watch, who follows us, uh, needs to tell everybody that they know because we need more people here. We've got a great studio audience tonight. Thank you, everybody. Cheers to all of you guys for Cheers. being here. We could use some more. So always, check us out on Facebook, Two Sweet Social Club. Um, always check out our website to find out when we'll be hosting new uh, Meet Your Makers, uh, tootsuite.com. We've got a wonderful, we've got a Twitter feed, everything. Thank you to 55 Degrees for constantly sharing us with those guys. Great wine storage up and in St. Helena. Yes. Yeah, and they store all of our wines too. So. And ship them all over America. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Julianne. It's always a pleasure. Cheers, Cheers everybody. Cheers. See you soon. All right. We're doing so, all right. No pressure. So I've heard some people say about Cab Look at that. A minute 30 under Kingsville time. Is that they're looking for the shale alone that is so ever present in the Kingsville district because of what it does in that other, with all the other growing conditions there, that the, the shale alone 